Welcome to the Property Voice Podcast, helping you to navigate safely through the world of property investing. Get the lowdown and updates, insights and outcomes on all matters property with a splash of entertainment along the way. The Property Voice, a voice to trust among the crowd. Now, let's get started with your host, Richard Brown. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Property Voice podcast. My name is Richard Brown and as always, it's a pleasure to have you join me on the show today. Now then, what could possibly have been on your mind during the past week or so, I wonder? Could it be the implications onto us and our property investments as a result of the uh, the emergency budget the other week? Yep. Me too. So that's what today's episode is all about. And it's, uh, it's aimed at addressing some, not necessarily all, but just some of the key changes that will, uh, affect us as property investors, you know, resulting from the, uh, the recent budget. And a special word of thanks has to go out to one of our listeners called Jay, who kindly suggested the topic for this week's show. So thanks for that, Jay. Although I have to say that when he first suggested it, I was like, oh, this is so complicated. It just depends is the answer because um, tax changes, etc., really do depend on our personal circumstances and our objectives. So it, it's going to be hard to give any definitive hard and fast, you know, solutions, let's say, although I can present one or two potential options that we could consider. Um, so uh, thanks for that, Jay. Uh, yeah, it, it's a tough call, really. But what I plan to do is to go through some of the changes, what they mean, some of the implications, some of what we can do, and maybe some of the things that might stop us actually making some of those changes. So that's the idea of today's show in all honesty. So without further ado, let's get into today's topic with Property Chatter. Okay, so let's get on with this week's featured topic with Property Chatter. Okay, so <laughs> I really do expect many of you to be at least aware of some of the changes that came about through uh, through the Chancellor's uh, su- surprise. He called it an emergency budget, and emergency possibly is what it was called, but a surprise budget, some of the surprise changes we probably did not expect to see from a Conservative-led government, um, certainly this, this stage in Parliament. But um, maybe we shouldn't be surprised about anything. So the idea really is just to go through in this episode some of the main changes, as I mentioned, that were sprung upon us uh, from the from the budget, and you know consider what our options were. Uh, sorry, are in in fact. Now, I won't be discussing in any great detail all of those changes. For example, inheritance tax, the living wage, and some of the employer tax changes which technically could all have a bearing on us as, as property investors. I will touch on a, a, a perhaps a, a, a knock-on effect of inheritance tax, but certainly the other ones won't, I won't mention in too much detail, just for the sim- uh, sake of time, really, and, and just to reduce the level of complexity in an episode like this. But I will be talking about some of these following, uh, some of these changes I'm about to list now. And um, first one, of course, is the uh, the whole issue about mortgage interest relief. Uh, and that being capped. And I should say mortgage interest and finance charges uh, relief is going to be capped. And I'll explain more when I get to that topic. The other one that could be significant, especially we have furnished property, is the withdrawal of the fair, of the, sorry, wear and tear allowance. Um, the perhaps surprising ones might be the, the next two. One is the increase in the rent a room scheme tax allowance. And let's just talk a little bit about that and how it could be uh, of relevance to us, even if we don't directly claim it. It could have an impact onto us. Then let's have a look at some of the changes in how dividend income is going to be taxed. And you might be saying, well, I don't have any substantial dividend income because I don't invest for a company and that sort of thing. And I'll explain why that could be relevant as well, because it's certainly one of the options that we might wish to consider. So taking them all in turn, let's just have a recap of what those changes are. We'll do that. Then we'll go into uh, what the implications might be, uh, what our options are, and maybe some of the barriers that might stop us implementing some of those options. So that's the kind of the format or the running order, if you like. So let's start with this uh, mortgage interest and finance charges tax relief. And uh, the announcement in the budget is that starting from 2017-2018 tax year, the amount of tax relief we can claim against rental profits in respect of finance-related charges... 
So it's not just mortgage interest, but it also extends to broker fees, mortgage arrangement fees, and anything related to the financing of property is going to be capped at the uh, basic, uh, sorry, at the basic rate of tax, regardless of what tax bracket we, uh, we actually sit in. Now at the moment, it, there's no cap on it. It's so if we're a 40% or 45% taxpayer, we can offset the full uh, full cost of those charges and interest against our tax bill. So we get full relief, in other words. So that's changing. And um, it's going to be migrated in uh, on, a sl on a reducing scale basis. So there'll be a, a uh, we'll still get the relief this year and in 2017, eight, uh, and, and indeed next year. So uh, I, to, to uh, 2016, 2017. But the starting 2017-2018, there'll be a 75% uh, cap, then it'll be 50%, then it'll be 25%, and then it'll just be restricted to basic rate of tax. So we've got a little bit of time before we feel the full pain, but it will be brought in gradually over the next four years. So this quite clearly is going to affect, most of all, higher rate and highest rate taxpayers. Now, you might not be one today, but you might be one in, in the next four or five years, which is obviously when this will come into place. So even if you don't think it affects you now, it's probably worth paying attention to this because it could affect with some of the planning and that type of thing. So in a nutshell, what does it mean? It means a 40% taxpayer, so we'll park the 45% taxpayers probably for the rest of this episode, if you don't mind, but you can imagine that anything I'm about to say applies worse for 45% taxpayers. So uh, for 40% taxpayers, higher rate taxpayers, essentially means a halving of the benefit uh, from the 2020-2021 uh, tax year. So that's pretty significant. Uh, in, in order to quantify how significant, I actually decided to borrow some of the analysis uh, and sharing of information that uh, another investor who I know personally by the name of Kylie um, has done on her blog. And I can refer you to the blog. It's called uh, DIY to Property Investor. Co.uk, so it's worth a visit in any case because she's plotting her journey, and um, you know it's a story unfolding before our eyes of a uh, a, a fairly new property investor and and um, and how she's going about things, the challenges she faces. So, bit of a shout out really to Kylie in any way. But what I wanted to focus in on was uh, she did a little bit of analysis on a couple of properties in her current portfolio. A before and after, if you like. So she basically said, if these changes were introduced today and, and ignoring everything else, uh, what impact would it have? So uh, she she explains that she's a 40% taxpayer and uh, she did some analysis and just, just the headlines were that her retained after-tax profit from two of her rental properties that she analysed and she shares this data on her website would fall in one case from £1,230 a year so this is after tax remember so from £1,230 a year to around £730 on one property and on the other one it would fall from around £1,260 after tax to around £534 on the other one so that's a £500 or 41% reduction in her after-tax profit, retained profit on one property, and um, £726 reduction, or a whopping 58% reduction on the other one. Now, you probably think 41% doesn't sound so bad when it compares to 58%. Um, I think the difference, you know, um, between the two properties can be explained by the proportion, maybe, of uh, interest as, a, as an overall proportion of costs, probably the loan-to-value, probably the, level, the interest rate that applies in each case as well. So there'll be a number of factors which explain that difference, but you can see quite clearly how, um, you know, I talked about this halving of, uh, of the, uh, of our profitability as a result of this change, 41% to 58%. The average of that is around about 50%, um, you know, reduction in our profitability. So the halving analysis is borne out very well by Kylie there. So that really does illustrate the point, I think, doesn't it? That we're going to see less profit if we fall into that situation. However, um, apart from Kylie's analysis, it doesn't really end there. So if if um, interest rates increase, now who, who thinks interest rates are going to stay as low as they are now forever? They're not, are they? But if interest rates were to increase, this reduction in profit will be felt even more severely. And, and in fact, I'd actually go on to say there's a double whammy effect, if you like. So first of all, the increased interest payments will obviously reduce our rental profits. 
So, you know, that's obvious, I suppose. We're in low interest rates. If interest rates rise, we'll have higher costs. Therefore, our, all things being equal, bearing in mind, um, you know, our, our profitability is going to, to reduce. So, but the second part of the equation, of course, is the, this restriction in our tax relief. So we, we may even find ourselves not just with lower profitability, but also potentially under certain situations with not enough cash even to pay for the tax bill. So if you take, um, if you take Carly's illustrations, an extra, uh, 500 pound reduction just because of an interest rate rise on, on one of her properties would wipe out all profitability. But actually they still have to be taxed to be paid. So there might in fact have to be extra money to be found out of her own pocket in that situation. That's why I say it could be a bit of a double whammy effect. So not just reduce profits, but even dipping into our, our pocket to find the cash to pay for the tax. And I guess you could say that's an ouch. Now, I will discuss some of the wider implications or the what-if scenarios in a minute. Suffice to say, this change will hit some investors quite hard. So for now, let's just move on to, to the next big change. So the next thing I want to talk about is the withdrawal of the wear and tear allowance, which applies to uh, landlords of furnished property. And uh, currently, landlord investors that let furnish a prop uh, furnished property rather can opt to claim this allowance, and um, it, claim it equates to 10% of the annual rental income by way of a tax relief. Then the aim is to provide us with some relief uh, to to cover things like depreciation, repair, and replacement of the furniture, and in so by so doing so. Uh, encourages good standard of furnishing in rental properties because we get a tax credit. The tax credit helps to fund uh, the, the the replacement cost of furniture. Therefore, we're more likely to replace furniture, etc., etc. So that was, I guess, is the original intention. Now, the change announced would mean that this allowance would be replaced by uh, limiting it to a claim on actual in expenditure on furniture instead. So previously, there was this arbitrary 10% of the rents we could claim. Uh, and that was regardless of our, our actual expenditure. But going forward, starting from the next tax year, so it's April next year, will be limited to the claiming against our actual expenditure instead. And to illustrate the point, uh, for example, I have a, an HMO which is furnished. Uh, the annual rent is around about £34,000 a year. Under the current rules, I can claim £3,400 against my rental profits as a tax deduction, regardless of how much I spend on furniture in any one year. And this means in some years I would win, in other years I would lose. Obviously, when I first took out the property and invested in all the furniture, uh, I could well have spent more than £3,400. I actually did. And so I would have lost, I would have lost in the first year. But in subsequent years, maybe I've got, you know, lower expenditure, just the light ref repair, refurbishment or the odd replacement. I'd probably be spending a lot less than £3,400. So uh, I guess in that case, I'd be winning. So, you know, as I mentioned, it'd be, you know, this, uh, a couple of years of winning, a couple of years of losing. Um, I have to say that this, uh, arbitrary 10% per year rule was in fact open to some abuse. Uh, so just to illustrate the point, some, some investors wouldn't spend any money or not, not much money on the furnishings, but would make the claim. So they'd be getting the tax kicker, but they wouldn't be investing the tax uh, saving into, uh, you know, adequate or, or a good quality furnishings or replacing them more frequently in, in their properties. In fact, there were a couple of creative st tax strategies around, uh, specifically designed to capitalize on this, on this particular thing. So I guess it, it was open to abuse and, uh, that loophole has been, uh, has been closed. So in all honesty, I have to say the change is probably maybe unpopular among some, but it's probably fair. And so, um, I guess, you know, they're not saying you can't claim for any cost of replacement furniture. Indeed, you can. So it's still a legitimate uh, tax deductible expense. It's just that the methodology has been changed and probably in a more fair way, I would say. So the next uh, change really I wanted to discuss was the increase in the rent a room scheme allowance. Now, you might be wondering how this tax break aimed at homeowners is relevant to property investors. Well, allow me to explain. First of all, what is it? Well, the Rent-A-Room scheme is an allowance provided by HMRC that allows a homeowner to let out one or two rooms to lodgers in their own home tax-free. The allowance was £4,250 a year, 
And this meant that homeowners could earn this amount of money from, uh, from rent, from lodgers, or taken in guests from sites such as Airbnb, for example, uh, before paying any tax at all. And anything above that would then be subject to tax based on their uh, highest tax rate. In the budget, this allowance was increased uh, from 4,250 to £7,500. As I say, it's for homeowners. So it's a, it's a massive boost to household income. And if you think of it as a salary equivalent, it's worth something like a pay rise of about £11,000 a year if you're a basic rate taxpayer. That's quite significant. And of course, that will be a much equivalent to a much higher tax, uh, sorry, pay rise if uh, you happen to be a higher rate taxpayer. Now, I believe that the reason why the government is supporting this is to pro uh, provide further assistance to homeowners, especially if they're living in expensive areas, but also as a, a way of reducing the house housing shortage uh, as it encourages more people to live in fewer numbers of properties. Obviously, if we take in a lodger, it's not just a family that lives there anymore. It's, a, it's, a, it's maybe two family units, I suppose, for want of a better description. So that's my interpretation anyway. I'm sure the government has their own rationale, but that's my interpretation of why I think they're doing it. And in truth, I've I got to say, I think it's an excellent tax break that uh, anyone owning a property could well, uh, do well to look into. The obvious downside, of course, is that we end up sharing our home, obviously. So uh, I'll discuss how this could affect, uh, f affect us specifically as property investors a little bit later on, but I just wanted to get the, uh, the change out there into the open right now. And the next change that's come about that could have a bearing on us is changes to how uh, dividend income is going to be taxed. And again, as a property investor, you might be saying, well, I don't have you know, substantial amounts of dividend. I invest personally, so it doesn't really apply to me. But um, owning and renting property personally, um, you know, it, it might be something you might wish to consider changing as a result of this budget, not least of which from changes to mortgage interest relief and uh, finance charges relief that I mentioned earlier. So a lot of uh, a lot of investors, and if you just look at a lot of the, the dialogue that's going on in the last week or so, a lot of investors have said, I'm going to invest through a company instead. And of course, if we're to invest through a company, then we're most likely to take advantage of dividends. So it becomes highly relevant. So what exactly is changing? Well, it's a bit complicated dividend uh, income tax, oh, sorry, dividend tax. So I'm just trying to keep it simple. Now, currently, dividend uh, income is, is uh, paid free of any further tax liability for uh, basic rate taxpayers. And uh, higher rate taxpayers will pay a marginal rate of tax of 25%. As I mentioned, I'm not going to discuss for highest rate taxpayers, but you can imagine it's a little bit more than that. And, and of course, paying um, a marginal tax of 25% is a lot better than paying a 40% tax, uh, income tax on PAYE earnings. So you can obviously see why it's appealing to maybe try and transfer some income from PAYE based earnings into dividend income instead, because there's clearly a tax advantage in doing so. Hence why people are looking at uh, switching to investing through a company and trying to move from uh, taking salary and taking dividend income instead. The change that's come about basically means that the first £5,000 now going forward of dividend income will be free of tax. So it was, it was essentially unlimited, but it's now capped at £5,000. So even if we're a basic rate taxpayer, we'll now be asked to pay tax on any dividend income over and above that £5,000. And uh, it will be at a rate of 7.5% for basic rate taxpayers or 32.5% for higher rate taxpayers. So in effect, tax on dividend income has been increased by 7.5% um, apart from the first £5,000. So dividend income through earned through tax efficient saving plans such as an ISA, for example, won't be affected by this change. So it's only things that sit outside of those structures that are going to be affected. Of course, the question is, how is it relevant? Well, as I mentioned, many property investors either do already or if not, are definitely now considering putting their property business into a company structure. And this would lead to more potentially more uh, favorable uh, tax treatment by drawing dividends instead of uh, PAYE or, or income tax based earnings, if you like, which we would do as uh, a personal investor. So uh, it might seem like a simple choice, but it might, as we'll see later on, it isn't necessarily going to be the case. 
So as I mentioned, there will be some implications and some consequences as a result of these changes. Um, I'm just going to go through some of them, just focusing in on the main changes that I've, I've uh, highlighted um, in turn. So starting with um, the capping of the mortgage interest and finance charges, this tax relief uh, cap that's being brought in. It's probably going to impact investors that are, or, or most significantly, which are uh, higher rate taxpayers, but also using higher levels of mortgage borrowing the most. So these investors in particular, and by the way, we could fall into this category at a later stage, so it's worth knowing the change and thinking, oh, it's not going to affect me, but it could affect us in the, in the future. So for these investors, it, investors rather, it's going to lead to uh, lower profits, as Kylie's figures illustrate. But also um, the potential for some investors to be left with a cash shortage to even pay for their tax bill. So if interest rates rise, we're highly leveraged, we're higher rate taxpayer, we may find that we've got not only reduced profits, but also that we need to find extra cash to pay for our tax bill, the double whammy that I talked about earlier. And some particular investors might in fact feel trapped because if they have been refinancing, uh, using refinancing as a strategy to release money from their portfolios, they may well be in the position now where their uh, mortgage borrowing is above the original purchase price uh, of the property. And so, um, you know, they might be left with insufficient funds to pay with, uh, sorry, to pay any capital gains tax on a potential sale. Because one of the options I'm going to discuss later on is to exit the market. To exit the market, we'd need to sell our property. But we might be trapped. Uh, under certain situations. So, you know, there could be this, this vicious circle scenario. And, and indeed, you know, some investors might have difficulty refinancing at all because some of the consequential changes of these uh, tax, tax ch changes will probably, in my opinion at least, lead to some changes to lenders' criteria. Because lenders, as you're probably aware, have to do stress testing now uh, against uh, any borrowing that they, they agree for an investor. And that usually means, you know, stress testing their affordability, the, the investor's affordability, at a higher rate of interest. Well, of course, now it's not just a higher rate of interest that they'd be concerned about. It is also a lower rate of tax relief and therefore cash flow from the property. So I'm expecting lenders to change the criteria. And, and so you might find selling might be very difficult if you, if uh, you haven't got enough cash to pay for the capital gains tax liability. And uh, refinancing might be difficult as well um, if we're in a position where the, um, the lender might want to cap our borrowing. So um, there's a couple of little tra traps there potentially I can I can foresee. So I'm not sure uh, if if what what's been announced will be the final outcome. Let's hope there'll be some changes to allow some relief for people who find themselves in that situation. Now, as far as the wear and tear allowance for furnished properties uh, is concerned, there's going to be some winners and losers here in terms of the after tax uh, sorry after tax position. You know, however, the, the, the changes will mean a return to a more normal or a fair record of actual costs and profits for investors with furnished properties. So we really should have no complaints, at least in principle, about this, unless we're just being a bit selfish, that is. So, you know, you know there will be a transition and, you know, may, where the two systems have to be migrated. So that, care, you know, needs some careful examination. But uh, certainly um, in, in for new expenditures going forward from the next tax year, Probably it's fair, I would say, just to be able to claim an offset against our taxable profit for actual expenditure. It seems like a fair change to me anyway. Now, as far as the rent a room scheme is concerned, indirectly, this doesn't affect us, of course, as property investors. However, if we're also a homeowner, and of course, many of us will be, then it does provide us with another opportunity, uh, an opportunity to increase our income from property. Um, as I mentioned, actually, a couple of episodes ago in looking at our home as a tax efficient asset. So that's an opportunity. The, um, the second consideration possibly is, 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 is maybe not so obvious that in the medium term, I do wonder whether this, um, this tax incentive is clear. You know, there's been a big jump. It's clearly aimed as a tax incentive for, for homeowners to let out rooms in their property. Now, this could have a bearing on the room rental market, uh, you know, in terms of extra supply of rooms available to rent, obviously, in this case, from homeowners. 
And if, if that's the case, it could have a bearing um, um, in terms of HMO landlords, there'll be greater competition. So that's something to keep an eye on uh, and something to watch out for. And I think uh, particularly in, uh, in, in, in low supply areas, it, it could actually start to increase supply and that could have a bearing on, uh, on, on rents, let's say, for room rentals for HMO landlords. Now, the dividend income tax Again, at the surface, we may think this might not affect us. However, if we already receive dividend income, for example, we're a shareholder in listed companies and we just have dividend income paid to us as uh, uh, people, uh, these companies announce their dividends. But uh, equally, if we have our own business, say we're self-employed or, you know, we're a director in a company, we may be receiving dividend income in that way. So quite clearly in those situations, it, it quite possibly might lead to a higher tax bill. Uh, than is currently the case. So that's one thing. But actually, if we um, add this to the other tax changes, then, you know, it's actually going to be a tough one to take. And indeed, it's something that we're going to have to pay careful consideration to if we already invest through a company or we're considering doing that too. So <laughs> there's the news. I'm not sure if it's, uh, I'd say it's balanced. It's probably balanced, but it's probably quite a shock, especially with the mortgage interest relief. So what are our options? What can we do about it? So when we hear about these sorts of changes, we naturally go through a process, don't we? We, we may be shocked or surprised, then possibly even angry or at least worried. But then we'll start to look at it and what are we going to do about it and plan going forward. Obviously, that's the best you know place that we need to be. So moving from shock, complaint, moaning, anger, etc. into what can we do about this? And that's a stage I just want to cover off a little bit brief, uh, a little bit now in brief. Um, and as I mentioned right at the beginning, it depends. So there isn't a one size fits all solution, unfortunately. But I will talk about some of the potential options that we, we might wish to consider. So. Following the budget, anyone with a personal, um, a higher personal tax uh, rate is going to be faced with a few basic choices. Um, we can look to increase our income to cover the tax position. So, for example, this could be by increasing rents or growing our portfolio to cover the tax, uh, tax increase. We could look to reduce our costs to cover the increased tax cost. And this could be by aiming to reduce our borrowing levels. Uh, addressing the overall costs of running our property business. Um, certainly, in my view, uh, one part of the, the government's aim here is to encourage reduced levels of debt for buy-to-let investors. So it, it is going to stimulate uh, us to look at it in that, uh, in that direction for sure. We could equally look to switch to more favourable alternative tax environments. And I talked about tax arbitrage in a previous episode. So this could mean, for example, considering investing through a company to move from income tax to dividend tax. But equally, it could mean um, switching strategy uh, with a similar objective, but switching strategy perhaps to look to replace income tax with capital gains tax. Um, and indeed, it could be, and so that would be, for example, selling buy-to-let properties and using letting relief and, and things like that if it used to be our home. So yeah, there, could, there could be any number of elaborate tax planning approaches as well, which I don't really wish to venture into, but the switching environment, tax environments is the, is the headline. Equally, it could lead to us considering exiting the market. Basically, selling up and moving on is certainly going to be an option that some may wish to consider. And to be to be honest, in some situations, I can see why this why this could be attractive uh, for, for example, smaller portfolio in investors or indeed accidental landlords, as they're called, especially if they've got high levels of borrowing and indeed they pay a higher tax rate. That you know, other forms of investment are suddenly going to start to look a lot more compelling um, when they're faced with uh, these tax changes, certainly from the mortgage interest relief and finance charge being capped at the basic rate. So, you know, things like ICEs and pensions and other alternative investments, you know, where there's more of a tax incentive, um, are going to uh, be more appealing. I think equally, I haven't talked in detail about the inheritance tax changes, but uh, essentially, um, 
uh, we can pass down our own property to our uh, descendants with a higher uh, or sorry, less less of an inheritance tax issue going forward as a result of this budget. So it's going to encourage us to invest in our own home, quite quite frankly. Uh, and this, along with the rent a room scheme, could actually make you know plowing more money into our own home even more attractive. And the, there could be some unintended consequences of that, you know, uh, stagnation of the housing market, for example, is one I could think of. So the idea, the point I'm really making here is that for some investors, you know, switching strategies or considering alternatives is definitely going to be uh, something that they're, they're, they're focusing in on. And of course, this idea I spoke about a couple of episodes ago, uh, potentially of converting our home to a buy to let and then selling on and then rinsing and repeating every few years, you know, could also be something that is going to rise up the, uh, the priority list. But what I would say is if our intention is to develop a, a larger portfolio, you know, larger, I mean, six or more properties probably, then other options do exist. And so it may well be worth pushing through the pain barrier, as it were, or or even considering alternative options. So, you know, maybe sit tight if you're in that situation. But I think in conclusion, it's, uh, it is going to make it more of a, a professional investment uh, business case, you know, what, what our options are. Now, of course, I've mentioned some options, but they're not all necessarily going to be straightforward or applicable in every case. And I'd have thought of, of some challenges that uh, might arise with some of these options. So, for example, we, we may not be able to simply increase rents. It's, uh, it's all very well to say we're going to increase rents to cover the cost. But um, first of all, not everybody is going to be affected by these changes. It's only affecting a segment of the market, i.e. higher rate taxpayers. It isn't going to affect basic rate taxpayers. So there's no incentive for basic rate taxpayers to increase rents. Second of all, do we believe in market pricing where rents are set by supply and demand factors? Well, you know, it, it isn't necessarily going to uh, improve that situation. So increasing rents isn't going to be an easy thing to do. We might also not have the capacity to grow our portfolio, as I mentioned, um, growing the portfolio might be a way out of this, you know, that we can you know, effectively create more income to cover the tax position. But that comes with some financial limitations, for example, having deposits available to grow the portfolio. So that might not be such an easy thing to do as well. We may have uh, limited ability to reduce our costs. You know, for example, if, um, you know, already on low energy rates, if we've got HMOs or we can't really do much about council tax, um, you know, we we don't necessarily want to be scrimping and scraping and and uh, limiting our repair and maintenance bills because that's going to store up problems for the future. One potential option could be moving from uh, using letting agents to self-managing. So that's possibly a trend I might see come uh, coming about. But of course, that comes with additional workload, and of course, you know, we're going to need to be up to speed with knowledge and that type of thing. If we get things wrong, it can actually cost us more in the long run. So. That's a bit of a trade-off that could come in in that particular uh, scenario, I'd imagine. We also might find ourselves in an equity trap of sorts. Do you remember I mentioned earlier about um, not being able to sell because not being able to afford the capital gains tax or not being able to refinance because of changes to lender criteria or, which affect uh, uh, stress testing and affordability? So we may not be able to do those things. We, we, might, uh, we might be thinking that we can... Um, get uh, get a tax saving by switching to a limited company but in order to do that uh, especially at the smaller scale we might find ourselves with a stamp duty and or capital gains tax bill on the way in or indeed at a later stage so you know we we often find ourselves trading off different tax environments so we win on the swings and we lose on the roundabouts we win today, we lose tomorrow, or vice versa. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, it depends. And so uh, it might not be easy or possible. And we just may be giving ourselves different problems instead of uh, fixing all our problems. And of course, we might be tempted to call it a day. But if we already have, uh, and if we already have a good pension in place, uh, we take advantage of our ISO allowance and are concerned, you know, just just as with this government has made changes to the tax rules, so too could subsequent governments do that. And of course, that really means to having a balanced view to our investing portfolio. Um, and so, you know, knee-jerk reactions, just exiting, you know, one asset class might not be in our best interest. So, you know, what I'm really saying here is it, it might be worth sticking with it. Uh, going through some short-term pain and, uh, and and really having some careful planning 
uh, to, ha to have, again, what I would call a more professional approach to, to in our investment, uh, property investment business. So that's about as far as I wanted to take the discussion today, in, in all honesty. And I've, I've got a number of additional ideas of my own. And, uh, you know, I, but I would say I'm not going to share all of those, certainly not in, in, in this forum, because as I mentioned, it depends, it depends, it depends. So I think the best piece of advice overall I can, I can probably outline is to seek professional advice. And, and that way we can consider things, you know, from our own personal positions point of view and not simply plowing into a change just because it sounds like the right thing to do. Now I am hearing of many people say they're going to switch to investing via a company. However, it might not always be the best thing to do. So it really does depend on our personal circumstances and indeed our overall investment objectives. One thing is for sure though, the accountants, tax planners and general financial, financial advisory uh, professional uh, fraternity, if you like, is going to be a whole lot busier as a result of this budget. So my, my overall conclusion, I guess, is this. If we adopt a professional approach to what is already a business operation, this means that we should be looking to plan carefully, seek the right kind of professional advice, and then structure our affairs that provide safeguards and contingencies against short-term changes, such as we've heard in this budget. So if we put plan for the long term and, and have a little degree of flexibility or contingency or protection for short term changes, that's indeed the best uh, approach I can think of uh, of making at this point in time. Now, I did originally have another musings episode in mind for this week. However, the budget really did set the cat amongst the pigeons. And as Jay, one of our listeners, asked me so nicely, I decided to do a budget special episode. So here it is. And I hope you found that useful. Please remember that... Uh, there's never any unsurmountable problems, only opportunities and obstacles for us to overcome. So let's keep moving forward is my, my rally call at the end of this episode um, to maybe try and lift your spirits, if you like. Now, the show notes are going to be available at the website, thepropertyvoice.net. And uh, we've added a few things, actually, just talking about the website. We've added a few um, aspects to the website recently, not least of which an investment partner offering. So maybe you'd just like to go and have a look at that in any case and uh, just appraise yourself with uh, what's on offer there. Uh, if you can't be bothered or you might forget, just ping us an email, partner at thepropertyvoice.net, and we can start a conversation as to what we're up to. Be more than happy to do that. So there we go. Another week is over. Perhaps we've been a bit down in the dumps, uh, but uh, hopefully I've managed to lift your spirits a little bit. We have options. Remember, we have options. So thanks very much for listening to another of In My Musings mini-series. And a special and final word of thanks has to go to Jay for suggesting today's episode, but also to Kylie for her transparent sharing of her portfolio's uh, financial performance too. But until next time on the Property Voice podcast, it's ciao, ciao. Thank you for listening today. Now head over to thepropertyvoice.net for more inspirational content and get updates through our mailing list. Join us next time on the Property Voice podcast. And if you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to rate us on iTunes.